Tonight's subject is God only acts. You may be familiar with that statement from Blake. God only acts and is in all existing beings or men. We are told that what is impossible to men is possible with God if we can only find God. For what is impossible with us as men is possible with God. I am confident I can locate him for you right this night. And it's very simple. There are unnumbered things that you and I can think of that are truly impossible with us. Unnumbered things you can think of them. Now, could you imagine the thing that is to you impossible solved? Can't you imagine it solved? Think of something that you cannot. I defy you to think of something that you cannot imagine. Think it over. And so you say, I can't go because I haven't a passport. I can't go, say, to Russia. They wouldn't allow me to go to Russia. I couldn't get a passport. Can't you imagine that you have a passport? Can't you imagine that you've been to Russia and that you're back? You may say, well, that's a lie. There is no evidence to support that imaginal act. But can't you imagine? Can you imagine it? Well, that's God. That's God in action. If you can imagine, all I ask you do now is to hold God trustworthy. You found him. You found something that can imagine anything in this world. Well, that's God. For with him, all things are possible. And with men, there are unnumbered things that are not possible. So you found in yourself a power that makes everything possible. But all God intends from us is to accept the imaginal act with faith. That's all. Faith is being loyal to unseen reality. You remember what you did. That's an imaginal act. All it takes from us now is to be loyal to that imaginal act. For through faith we made all things. An imaginal act is one thing. And that's self-determining, that's causative. Everything on the outside moves under compulsion, but everything, and no one really knows the unseen, hidden, causal act. Once in a while you can trace it. The individual may be able to trace it back to something that he did. But between the imaginal act and its unfoldment in the world, in this whole vast world, unnumbered things come out all contributing, and much of it we condemn. We condemn this act and that act and that act and harshly condemn it. But it all is moving towards the fulfillment, the bloom of what each in the silence did back here. And yet we sit in judgment of all the unfolding picture of that act, right up to the bloom of the act. Now let me share with you a story that was shared with me. About two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, I told you a story. It was unfinished. It wasn't yet completed. About the lady who had carried this tremendous burden on her shoulders, as it were, for 25 years. And suddenly, that very day, it was washed out of her life, completely washed out. But I didn't know the nature of the burden. It wasn't yet told me. In fact, it wasn't yet told him. He just wanted me to know, to encourage me to encourage you of this story. Well, this is the story. It's all about his mother, who lives in St. Louis. That's maybe one fifteen hundred miles away. So take that into consideration when you hear the story. She has a very important position. She is executive secretary to an organization similar to our bowl here. You might have seen these great shows in the summer. They produce, every summer, 12 musicals are produced. And you either take them, or you've read about them, or you've heard about them. And so, she has been, and still is, for many, many years, executive secretary of this organization. But in spite of the glamour of the job, and all the wonderful things she enjoys on the outside of her home, because in that capacity, and as I'm told in his letter, that one of the great status symbols in St. Louis, 
is to be a member of that board. And so they all love her, all respect her, they all admire her, and she enjoys their friendship. And so all the lovely social graces and friendships are hers outside of her home. But in her home, she's not been able to entertain any of these people who entertain her. Because 25 years ago, her father, just moving like the old man of the sea, fell. Well, being her father, she didn't want to do anything to simply dispossess him, as it were. He said, in a strange and wonderful way, he is a very remarkable man. Because not very many men have reached the advanced age of 95 without ever having done one day's work in his life. Well, that happens to be her father. And he said to me, a remarkable accomplishment, 95 and not once ever having done a day's work. So there he sat. Well, when he became aware of my books, the first thing he did, he packed off a set to his mother in the hope that she would read them and apply the technique as described in the books. When she came home this Christmas, he discovered she hadn't really applied it, and he would like to know why. Well, she confessed she could see no out to this but, death of her father. And if she applied it in the way that the book teaches, she might produce a death, and then she'd have to live with that on her conscience for the rest of her days. And although she would love the freedom of living alone in a nice, lovely home, where all things were lovely, she still would persist in this horrible sacrifice and carry this burden, rather than face the only out that she could think of, that the man would die. Then he told her the story that he heard from this platform, that when I found myself in love with the girl who now bears my name, I was terribly involved. I mean, so many complex facts confronted me. I had a dancing partner the world thought I should marry, and everyone thought I should marry her. I was not yet divorced from my first wife, and yet here, I'm in love with this girl. Well, I knew I could not be happy in this relationship of marriage if it caused any distress to my dancing partner. Yet I postponed and postponed the joy of mine by not doing something about it, not acting. One night I said to myself, if I am now blissfully happy in this new relationship of marriage, then it could not be really a happy state if I knew that my dancing partner was injured in any way by this act of mine. So I will simply forget all of that and assume that I am blissfully happy which would include that she's happy. I did it night after night for six nights, and then she confronted me and told me she didn't know how to tell me she didn't want to hurt me, but I was to her like a brother. She couldn't think of me in terms of her husband, and that she had found a doctor. She mentioned his name, a friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine, and that she and this doctor had been, well, lovers for the longest while, and that she hoped one day to marry him, and she thought I should know it now. Well, here I had been going for the longest, while not wanting to hurt her, and she not wanting to hurt me, and we both robbed each other of the joy that was really in store for us. So he told his mother of this story. He said, I saw in her eyes a certain glimmer of interest, so I said it over and over, in the hope that she would actually apply it. But she didn't tell me when she left here that she was going to apply it. So what I did was this. I imagined that she had done it and done it successfully. So I imagined that she had applied this principle towards that end and that she had been most successful in the application of the principle. Then a telephone call came that she didn't mention what the father did, but he did something to outrage the neighbors. It was something that really outraged the entire neighborhood. And then she said to him, I must make a decision. And her decision was to move. 
Then he said to her, I've decided too. I'm going back to my home 50 miles from here, from which I originally came. Then came a letter, which he enclosed to me, in which he told me that she saw the place. He has a beautiful room, and she saw the meals he's having, and so he has wonderful meals and living in a beautiful room. Now, for the first time in 25 years, without the man dying, she can have her own lovely apartment and do what she's been wanting to do for the last 25 years. So you see, you hurt no one when you apply this law and really act. God only acts and is in all existing beings or men. So he has found God, definitely found God, for he found the cause of the phenomenon of life. And back here, I think he knows it tonight, that whatever that grandfather did, Whatever he did, he could have done something that if he were not 95, could possibly it would go very hard with him today. He may, I don't know. But you know who did it? The one back here. He wasn't quite sure that the mother did it. And so he was taking no chances. And so he imagined that the mother had imagined herself in this new wonderful place and that it was successful. And so now that thing was causal. And everything that had to take place to bring about the fulfillment of that imaginal act took place, including a man performing some kind of an act or saying something or doing something that outraged the neighbors. Now you judge the act and the old gentleman would be harshly judged. And yet he was compelled. For every outer act moves under compulsion. And that compelling force is in man as an imaginal act. It's the only creative force, and that is God. By him all things were made, and without him was not made anything that is made. John 1, 3. So you found God in that wonderful act. Therefore, why go elsewhere when you found exactly how this thing works? When you know what you want, you hurt no one. You simply go to the end. But may I tell you, you may cause many things to be, well, on the surface, to be very distressing, not to you alone, but to others, and sometimes never to you. But that's why in the end you'll understand the words, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Luke 23, 34. For everyone is acting in a way he doesn't really know why he's doing it. He thinks he initiated it. He doesn't. He's under compulsion because someone removed, not only in space, removed in time, is treading out the wine prey. And they're only instruments to bring about the fulfillment of that unseen imaginal act. So here, he has shared with me that I in turn may share with you. I am convinced that if you take me seriously and do it, I will get before I close on the 26th of May, 100%. I will have everyone who could testify to the truth of God's law. I mean that seriously. I don't mean 99%. I mean 100%. If you treat it seriously and act, God only acts and is in all existing beings or men. And if he starts with the premise that with men, things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. They couldn't understand how a rich man who is denied the right to enter the kingdom of heaven because he couldn't, it's easier for the camel to go through the needle's eye. And then they asked him, then who can get the kingdom of heaven? His reply was, with men, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Mark 10:27. So now you know that you can't conceive of something. No one can tell you something that you can't imagine. No one has ever gone to the sun. But can't you imagine it? No one has ever gone beyond the sun, beyond our sphere into some other sphere altogether. But can't you imagine it? There's nothing. You can't imagine. Therefore, all things are possible with God. Therefore, God must be my capacity to imagine. That's God. 
And if I try it and it proves itself in the testing, then I have found him. I try it again and it proves itself in performance. So I have confirmed that I have found him. Then I share it with others and they try it and it works. Then we have found him, haven't we? So I say, we can get from this group here 100% success that you can actually testify to the truth of God's law. I'd be satisfied and thrilled if 1% could testify to the truth of God's promise. But that is unconditional. Not a thing you can do about it. It just happens. But you can do everything about testing his law because his law is conditional. We are the operant power. For when it comes to his promise, that is something that thrills me beyond measure when I hear anyone confirm the promise. So now let me share with you what was given to me in the same letter. He said, last week I began to write you a letter. He was going to tell me how about a month ago he met God. He said, it's, um, it was then, at that meeting, soon after that meeting, that I began to write to you. But my experience in meeting God is not identical to yours. First of all, there was no meeting of an infinite might, only love, a mixture of light, joy, and love. That was the mixture. He said, unlike your experience, it was not a person, but fused with it, I did. And after so many years of being confused, it was a thrilling relief to be fused for a change. So he met God. Even though he didn't see God presented in bodily form, he was fused with God. You know what fusion is, where things are gathered together and actually gathered together as two by melting. That's an actual experience. You are fused with God and no power in eternity could ever put you apart. Read the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. No power in the world could ever, after such a fusion, ever bring about a separation of you two. Verse 38. And therefore, when we are fused with God, we have the same body, that same glorious body of God. And here we have unity and equality in diversity. He and I do not look alike. We're both men. I'm older. But we do not look alike, and yet we are both fused with the same body of God. So here we have equality in that body. We have union in that body, and yet diversity. That's the great mystery. When all are gathered together, one by one, not collectively, but one by one into the body of God. And eventually all will be in that one body, and it's our body, and the individual's body. That's your resurrected, glorious body. You can't describe it. In this man's case, it appeared to him as a mixture of light, that's right, of joy, that's certainly right, of love, absolutely right. So all mixed together. But it was not a person. It did not come and present itself in bodily form. In my own case, it was just as described in the seventh chapter in the book of Daniel, the Ancient of Days, right before me, clothed as he's clothed, looking just as he's described. And I am presented to him as described in that book, verses 9, 11. And the very open book, as described in that chapter, was present. Only three characters stand out in my mind. There were others, but three stand out. Infinite might. And they're sitting in what I would call a carriage, drawn by the most glorious horses. And then a woman, an ideal, like an angel, like a recording angel, writing at a table and an open book, as told us in the Bible. She wasn't composing, she was recording the most glorious angelic being, but woman, just simply recording. Then I'm presented to the Ancient of Days, and it is infinite love. In this same chapter, they speak of the animal, the beast that was slain. It doesn't tell you how it was slain. That was an experience of mine that came about the same time. It wasn't the same night. But whether that experience preceded this presentation or followed it 
it was not too long before or after. But that was the beast. And may I tell you, I'll share with you how the beast is slain. It is not said how the beast was slain, but love that night slew the beast. For here I found myself in the presence of the most horrible monster. And then I looked up, and this glorious being, not unlike the recording angel of that vision of the night, the same person really, only this one was standing and looking at me. And this one was down below and calling this glorious creature mother. As this hairy animal, hair from the head to the toe, like an ape, and the hair was reddish, sort of a reddish brown, and as it called this glorious woman, mother, I banged it. And then it kept on calling it mother mummy. And I pummeled it. I was so annoyed with it. And it gloated. It spoke and it gloated in my blows, violent blows, as though it were a masochist. It simply loved to be beaten. And then, something on the inside of me, from the very depths of my soul, knew, I can't tell you I heard a voice, but I knew that that was my creation, and so was she. Both are my creations. She embodied every noble thought that I have ever entertained. And it embodied every ignoble, horrible, monstrous thing I have ever entertained. And both were my offspring. I knew that if this monstrous hairy beast had no right to exist, that I was the cause of its existence. I pledged myself. There was no one to whom I could turn. I didn't pledge with another, all with myself. I swore to myself that if it took me eternity, I would redeem it. I had no sooner made the decision to redeem it, regardless of the cost to me in pain or in time. And when my decision was made, without anyone looking on, so it was all within me, before my very eyes, it melted. I have never in my life felt such compassion for anything as I did for this. No hate, nothing but sheer compassion, that I could bring into this world such a monstrous thing and allow it to live when it really shouldn't live. I didn't kill it in the sense of cutting off its head. I had compassion for it. And because it was the embodiment of all of my misspent energies, as it melted before my eyes, leaving not a trace behind it, all the energies that I saw embodied there came back to me. They actually came through me. I have never felt so powerful in my life. Everything that throughout the centuries, how long I don't know, unnumbered ages went into this monstrous creature, invisible to me with my mortal frame of it. It whispered into my ear, repetition of the deeds that fatten it, on which it would grow. So any opportunity to take advantage of would be encouraged by the whispering of this unseen monster that I, myself, had created. And every attempt to be noble in my world came, an encouragement would come from this noble creature that I had created. And so, at that very moment then, I discovered what I had done with sheer energy. For I gave it life. I brought it into being. It was my dweller on the threshold, and I faced it one night, and sheer compassion wilted it, and it melted before my eyes and vanished. But in vanishing, all the energies, they weren't dissipated, they returned to me who had put them into that horrible, monstrous form. So, the beast spoken of in that chapter, and you'll find it in Revelation, you'll find it in many chapters. The open book you find in many chapters, all through the Psalms, Isaiah. These are true visions. And so he didn't see the human form, but he was fused with the same being, for that being is love. When you fuse with it, the joy is beyond the wildest dreams. So he felt joy and life. You can't measure the life. For in the Father there is life. And as the Father has life in himself, so he's granted the Son also to have life in himself. John 5, 26. 
So fusion with it. The father, he's become the son who is one with the father and therefore has life in himself. So I can say to him that in this fusion, there is no Jew, no Greek, no slave, no free, no male, no female, only one in Christ Jesus. And all the powers of the world cannot ever divorce you from that fusion. He's one with it. So I can't tell him the thrill that was mine when I got that letter and began to read it. He said in his letter, which is irrelevant for the evening, but still it's part of the picture. He was writing a story when his wife happened by and said, Oh God, what another letter to Neville? You want to monopolize all the meetings? She said, read it. She didn't say it unkindly, at least not too unkindly. And so he said, I promised at the moment that I would delay writing any more letters for the next few weeks. But mother's note came this morning, and because I had mentioned it to you in a previous letter, I thought I should share with you the conclusion, and that you tell others as I have told you. So I want to thank him, and I want to ask her, please don't stop him from writing any more letters. So everyone, I want to get the letters and really get them in. I say everyone can bring me letters on the condition, which is the law. I hope most of you can send me something comparable to that fusion. For now, that's done. They could shoot him now, chop off his head, and they can do nothing to separate him from the love of God. He was called into that state. He didn't earn it any more than I did. What was God's secret of his elective love that night when he was about a month ago when he was called? He was called and he saw love, only love. For God is only love, really. But the love is so ecstatic, you can't deny the joy that is with it. And you can't deny the life that you feel when you are fused with it. You can't. But in that union, oh, what joy, what life. So all of the qualities he expressed perfectly. I still say to him, it may be this night, who knows, that you will see him presented just as the seventh chapter of Daniel presents him. Just as Daniel presents him, that's exactly what he looked like to me. And then you are that son of man who is brought and presented to the Ancient of Days. The recording angel, yes, she's there. Infinite might, yes, he's there. They do not look alike, but you can't deny infinite might when you stand in his presence. It was infinite might who sent me. And the words ringing in my ears were the words, time to act. Time to act. I had to discover how to act. It was time to act. Drink no more water. Take a little wine for your stomach's sake and your many afflictions. 1 Tim 5.23 I had been absorbing, absorbing, absorbing all the psychological truth I could get by attending all the lectures, reading all the books, and going mad trying to adjust the conflicts with all the so-called different aspects of truth. And the words are, Drink no more water. Take a little wine for your stomach's sake and your many afflictions. Certainly wasn't to take wine in a physical sense, although I must confess I enjoy it. But that was not the suggestion. Wine is how to apply it. You've been absorbing the psychological truth. That's symbolized by water. So I filled myself till I almost became waterlogged. And now... Don't take any more. Start to apply it by drinking a little wine. Put it into practice. I then had to put it into practice. And putting it into practice, I found God. For if by him all things are made, and without him was not anything made that was made, and I found out what I did and how I got something in result, well then, I found him. I tried it again and it worked again. I kept on trying it, sometimes a long delay, sometimes shorter. I can't quite bring it down to the point of why the delay, other than it's not a delay, 
It is simply the seed takes a different interval of growth, interval of time. One would come overnight, one would come while I'm doing it, and some would come the next day, the next month, the next year. But looking back, as I told you a week ago tonight, a story from which I have both and I tried to explain that night that I was the cause of her misfortune. The things she did for which she was criticized and sentenced and suspended, I did it. Had I not done the imaginal act, she would not have done what she did. And if she did do it, she would not have been discovered in the act. But she had to be discovered because she had to come forward that I could serve her with papers. She was hidden in the eight odd million people in the city of New York. There are over eight million buried in that enormous crowd. How are you going to find her when she leaves her address and gives no forwarding address? But she had to be found even as like a needle in a haystack. She had to come out of hiding because I had performed an act. Performing the act, I compel her to perform a certain act for which society condemns her. So who did the act? I did it. And so I only told the story to show you, don't judge anyone harshly. You may be the very one treading the wine press that is causing that act. Then you now sit in judgment and condemn. But when you awaken, you will say exactly what is said on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. They're all moved under compulsion. You awake, you are moving from the inside, and that's self-determining. You know exactly what you're doing, and you watch what you're doing on the inside, and you do it constructively, lovingly. But even a loving act as it was in his case, he loves his mother and wanted her to be free of a burden. He didn't want that grandfather to die, but he wasn't concerned as to how the mother would be set free. But he knew from the story that you've heard that if he felt her joy in her new home, that something would happen without hurt to her. Well, the old gentleman did something that outraged the neighbors and that she said to me, mother has not yet mentioned what he did. And as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't really matter what the old gentleman did. He could have done one in a thousand different things that would have caused the neighbors to rise and in some great fiery against him. It doesn't really matter. But the cause of whatever he did was 1,500 miles, removed in an imaginal act of a son who so loved his mother, he wanted her to be free from this horrible burden that she'd carried for 25 years. So I tell you, everyone do it and then share with me. But bear in mind, God only acts and is. He is not a passive spectator at this passage of history. He is the supreme actor, the supreme actor. So in everyone, God is acting and he's acting every time you sit down and imagine a thing with faith. That's how God acts. If you imagine and think, oh, well, that, that's nothing, that isn't real. Well, then, you've already canceled it at the very moment of saying that it was unreal. Do you recall the story we told you quoted from the great Carl Jung, that only when he credited the fantasy with reality did the thing work? For you who were not here, Carl Jung, who died in 61, and the book came out in 61, which is really a form of biography, and this night, he was contemplating the death of a friend whose funeral he had attended that day. The man had died suddenly without warning the day before and was buried that very day when Jung, in his bed, was seriously considering the man and his present state. Whether Jung believed in the afterlife or not is irrelevant to the story, but he's contemplating the friend and suddenly he senses the presence of the friend at the foot of his bed. As a great scientist, he said to himself, well, I know my Bundy, I know I went to his funeral, 
The man is dead, so he can't really be here. Then he arrested his thoughts. He said, what right have I? Wouldn't that be the most abominable thing to do to a friend? If the friend were here and I treated him as though he were not, and I was indifferent to him, wouldn't that be a horrible thing to do to a friend? So now I will credit him with reality. And so the minute he decided to credit him with reality and assumed he was there and real, the friend became very, very real in his imagination, turned around, walked through the door and beckoned him to follow, which he did. As he followed through the door, the friend went through the garden and he in his imagination followed onto the street. And then the friend walked several hundred yards up to his home where now only the widow lived, and he, in his imagination, followed the friend. He went to the friend's home. The friend went right through the first room into his library, mounted a little stool that was there up to the second shelf from the top, and pointed out four volumes bound in red. Then he pointed to the second volume. And then, as he pointed to the second volume, and that was the one he wanted to bring Jung's attention to, he disappeared. And of course, Jung broke the spell back on his bed. The next day, he physically went to the home and asked the widow for permission to see the library. As he entered the library here is the little stool that was in his vision of the night before. He mounted the stool, and there, second shelf from the top, are four volumes in red. He picked up the second volume and its title. The title of it, The Legacy of the Dead. Zola's translation into the German. Zola's work translated from the French into the German. But it was titled The Legacy of the Dead. That's all the man wanted to convey to Jung. Jung, the great giant in the mind, might believe that with the dissolution of the brain, there is no man. He might, because Freud believed that, and he was Freud's great student. So many psychiatrists believe that without the brain, there is no being, no entity. It vanishes with the dissolution of the brain. How they can conclude that I don't know, but many of them do. Well, Jung might have been on that verge. Well. Here is a man who is dead now. He went to the funeral. He returns to convince him of the reality of a post-death state and takes him to the place and points out a book where the title bears a great significance, The Legacy of the Dead. And so, Jung could take that in 1944, I think that happened. But he would not allow it to go into print until after his death. He died in 61, and the book came out in 61, after Jung himself had made his exit from this world. So the story is that when he gave reality to the so-called unreal state, it became so real, it could guide him to show the reality of an after-death state. So if you would now imagine something and give to it a same credit of reality, the thing would then become embodied and become real in your world. You can't take an imaginal act and treat it as unreal. Take your imaginal act and treat it as reality. Really believe it's real and have faith in the unseen reality that it will externalize itself in your world. So you take it and try it. And trying it, I know from experience you'll prove it. And then, if you're not the one in 10, or if you're not the nine, I should say, you'll write me a letter. Because not everyone who gets it ever writes a letter. And may I tell you, it doesn't really matter how well you write. If you just can barely print, but you can't express yourself in writing, tell me in the first person. I want to hear it that I may in turn share it, as I've been sharing this gentleman's story with you. But when I read the beginning of that letter, and he started the letter, that he may explain to me 
how a month ago he met God and then drew the story so vividly. It was not a parallel of mine, although I did meet infinite love and permitted myself to speak from that. He met love only. It was an infinite might. That doesn't matter. Might is but an aspect, an attribute of God. God is infinite love, almightiness and omniscience. They're only attributes of God, but God himself is all love. So you are fused, not with almightiness. That's an attribute he'll use. You're fused with the reality, and that's God. So he's right. He was fused with love. And when you're fused with love, you can't deny it's a delight, sheer joy that is present, and the sheer life that you feel. Life in yourself. Now, having had that experience, I can prophesy for him. All the things that I have told in my books that I've had as mystical experience happened after that experience. And so he can look forward to all these experiences where he'll come upon a scene like this and he will know for now there's life in him and he will arrest an activity in him and arrest as it's seen on the screen. He will arrest it and not a thing can move while he holds it still within him. Then he'll release it. Then all will continue on its way. And he will prove for himself that he has life in himself. That's going to happen to him as surely as I'm standing here. For everything that I have recorded happens after the fusion with God. Early dreams as a child, they were all preliminary preparatory, but that was really the beginning of it all, that fusion with God. And the night that I was called and brought into that state, I certainly didn't expect it. If anyone had told me that very day of coming in the very presence of God and seeing God as man, I might have smiled. I might have. Therefore, I can't blame anyone who smiles when I tell them that I met God and God, in presenting himself to me, presented himself in the human form. And that the human form is truly love divine. It's all love. And the fusion is so intense, it's a melting right in him without loss of identity. So every one of us will be one day united in that body. So we will have union and equality and diversity. Nay, no loss of identity whatsoever. Ah. So you hear this night that God only acts. I do not know your background. Not all of you, your religious background, what you believe in. As far as I am concerned, true religion is really a devotion to the most exalted reality of which one has experience. So this experience of this gentleman with the fusion with God is something he could never forget. And no priest in this world or rabbi in this world could in any way divorce him from that union. He will listen like a gentleman, occasionally, to any argument they have to present, but they could never persuade him to give up the notion. It's not a notion. This is a reality beyond anything that one who has not had it could ever conceive. So you couldn't present any argument to divert a man after the union with God. You will allow any argument, listen to it carefully, but you can't listen to the point of being deflected. First of all, you can't get out of the union. You're part of God. Fused with God, you could never in eternity ever be separated from God. There's no power in the world that could do it because God is more powerful. And no power could take you out of the body of God after you're invited into it and fuse with it. So tonight you take that. At least one person here, others have told me too. They're all coming towards the grand, really the only end, which is the fulfillment of God's promise. But that you must wait for and wait for it patiently. He said, wait for the promise of the Father. Just wait, because you can't earn it. When it comes, it's a gift, a complete gift. 
and then all the other things, they'll come with it. But in the meanwhile, his law being conditional, you need not remain as you are if you don't like what you are. For one second beyond hearing the law, you can take the law this night, knowing who God is. If God is doing it, and all things are possible to God, well, then it's done. I don't care what it is. It's done if it's all God doing it. If a little you is doing it, and you take someone you know, can't do it. But the minute you know that imaginal acts are God's acts, that God actually became you, that you may become God, and that you are all imagination, and God and you are one, therefore, if he actually became you, and he acts in you, the only thing in you that is completely, that you could say all things are possible to it, is your imagination. You can't think of anything in this world outside of your imagination that you can say of it, with it all things are possible, because almost everything else is impossible. You think of the things that you would like to do, and how many things are impossible if you take the little you of flesh and blood. But take yourself as imagination. Can't you imagine anything in this world but anything? If you can imagine it and actually accept the imaginal act as fact and wait in confidence that the imaginal act has all the power necessary and the plan wrapped within itself to externalize itself. And while he was here, 100 miles away, this imaginal act was taking the old gentleman and making him do something that would outrage the entire neighborhood. The old gentleman and his daughter would be totally unaware that an unseen imaginal act was cause of his behavior. Because they would say, what on earth is he doing? Or what in a household of that sort? with a daughter who is so gracious and so noble, and to have a father like that, how could he possibly do it? We would judge him harshly. The real culprit, if there's a culprit, was hidden 1,500 miles away, and he did it through love. He so loved his mother, he wanted his mother free and be separated without killing the grandfather. And so, you do it this way, do it in love. Every time you exercise your imagination lovingly on behalf of another, as he did, you're mediating God to that other. And so he mediated God to his mother. And only that act of the grandfather would have forced her to the decision. So she told him, I have to make a decision and I'm going to move. Then he comes forward and says, I'll make a decision too. I am moving, I am moving back to my home of my origin, really, 50 miles from here. Well, that's near enough, isn't it? I mean, you're not the only ones. Uh, 50 miles is a long way to walk at 95 years. And so she can go visit him and see him and leave him just where he is with his friends. All the meals are good, she said in her letter, for I read her letter. He was very gracious and loaned his mother's letter to me. And just as I've told you what he told me, the mother told him. And he need not be that curious to find out what he did. That is unimportant. Whatever he did, he outraged the people to the point where something had to be done and a move was in order and the move became a fact. So I'm asking you to take me seriously. And when you sit down this night in the silence, or when you go home and you are with yourself and gathered together and you imagine anything, do it lovingly. Of a friend, do it lovingly and believe it's done. That's God in action. And with God, all things are possible. You don't have to aid it, leave it alone. It's going to actually move itself through all and all things being interwoven, they will take anyone in the world that it can use to embody itself. And therefore, forgive all when you become the man or the woman you want to be.
All those who seemingly tried to oppose you on your forward motion were aiding you, but you didn't know it. Therefore, forgive them all in the end. A bird couldn't fly unless opposed. A fish couldn't swim unless opposed. A plane couldn't take off. You couldn't walk. Nothing in this world could really move unless opposed. So if you have opponents, then they're only playing the part. Because you dare to assume that you are the man, the woman, that you want to be, they had to come to give the necessary opposition. Without that, you wouldn't move. Now let us go into the silence.
Welcome to the Neville Goddard Insights Channel, your ultimate destination for exploring the profound teachings of Neville Goddard.